Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In the last lecture, we introduced the notion of an inner product and we are looking at the geometry induced by this notion of inner product. How did we define the inner product? Suppose x and y are two vectors in R k, we defined and denoted the inner product by x comma y and we defined it to be the sum of the product of the components which is just the generalization of the notion of the dot product we had when we dealing with vector calculus in two and three dimensions. This can also be written as y transpose x or x transpose y all of them mean the same thing. So, from now on when we say inner product we will be either denoting it by x comma y or we will denoting by y tra transpose x or we shall denote it by x transpose y and all of them mean the same thing the sum of the products of the components. Then we found some important properties of the inner product which was that the inner product was distributive and the inner product of a vector with itself gave the length squared and that is 0 only when the vector is 0. And the most important thing that the inner product induces and which we shall be focusing is the notion of orthogonality. What do we mean by this? Suppose we take two vectors in R 3 for example, then we had the dot product in our earlier calculus course uh, vector calculus courses which we defined as x 2 y 2 plus x 3 y 3 and we found in the normal Euclidean geometry the x and y are perpendicular to each other if and only if this dot product becomes 0. And we now generalize this notion to the R k using this inner product. If x and y belong to R k, we say that x is orthogonal or perpendicular is orthogonal to y if x comma y is equal to 0 that is the dot the inner product is 0. What does that mean? That is y transpose x is 0 or we can write this as x transpose y is 0 or if we expand this we can write this as x j y j equal to 0. So, when we say x and y are orthogonal we mean all these things the notation is x comma y equal to 0 and that means that the y transpose x or the x transpose y or the sum of the products of the components is equal to 0. From the definition the symmetry tells us that x is orthogonal to y if and only if y is orthogonal to x. So, from now on instead of saying x is orthogonal to y and y is orthogonal to x, we will just say x and y are orthogonal to each other, x and y are orthogonal to each other. So, the orthogonality comes from the fact that the inner product is 0, the inner product induces the notion of orthogonality and orthogonal is a geometric notion. So, the inner product induces the idea of orthogonality. We next began looking at the notion of orthonormal sets. This is 
this notion is the generalization it is the generalization of the i j k vectors which you would have seen in vector algebra in R 3. This is the generalization of these three vectors. What do these three vectors uh, have special? Each vector is orthogonal to the other vector i dot j is 0, i dot k is 0, k dot i is 0. So, they are mutually orthogonal vectors and each vector has length 1. So, this is a, a collection of vectors which have the special property that any two of them is orthogonal to each other and each vector has length 1. Now, we generalize this idea in R k because we have the notion of orthogonality induced by the inner product, we have the notion of length which comes out as the inner product of the vector with itself and therefore, we can generalize this no whole notion of orthonormality to the case of R k. So, now we generalize this. if S is u 1, u 2, u r is a set of vectors in R k, we say S is an orthonormal set, it is an orthonormal set in R k if any two of the vectors must be orthogonal to each other u i and u j must be equal to 0 if i is not equal to j. That says if you take any two different vectors from this set their dot product is 0, their inner product is 0 which means they are orthogonal. What do we mean by the length is 1? If we take i equal to j then I get u i comma u i that gives the length of u i squared, but we want that to be 1. So, that means this must be equal to 1 if i equal to j. So, the first condition is the orthogonality condition the fact that any two vectors are orthogonality. The second one is the normalization condition, normality condition. Each vector has been normalized to have length 1 and that is why we call the set as orthonormal set or if you want to write it in terms of the transpose notation, this means E j transpose u i is equal to 0 if i not equal to j 1 if i equal to j. So, the vectors are orthonormal if any pair of them is orthogonal to each other and every vector has length 1. Let us look at some simple examples. Since we have seen that this notion of orthonormality itself is a generalization of the i j k vectors the i j k vectors come out as the first natural example of orthonormal sets. So, we have R 3 in R 3 now we will in the in our vector space notation we will denote the i vector as e 1 1 0 this is the j vector 0 1 0 and e 3 0 0 1 is an ortho normal set in R k. Notice that the vector v 1 equal to 1 minus 1 0, v 2 equal to 1 1 0 is an orthogonal set because yet the two vectors are orthogonal to each other is an orthogonal set in R 3, but it is not an orthonormal set because the normalization of length being 1 is not satisfied. 
the length of 1 is v 1 is uh, square root of 2 and the length of v 2 is also square root of 2. So, but not an orthonormal set since v 1 v 1 is equal to 2 not equal to 1 v 2 v 2 is 2 not equal to 1. But now, if we take the new vectors that we are going to form w 1 and w 2 which are obtained by normalizing v 1 v 2. What is meant by normalizing v 1 v 2? They do not have length 1. So, now we divide by the length then we get a unit vector. So, we take v 1 and divide by its length which is square root of 2 and we take v 2 and divide by its length. Now, this set is an orthonormal set in R 3. Because now, the w 1 and w 2 are orthogonal to each other and each one of them has length 1. Let us take R 4 again in R 4 look at these vectors u 1 1 1 1 u 2 is equal to 1 1 minus 1 1 minus 1 u 3 equal to 1 0 minus 1 0. If you now look at u 1 comma u 2 the inner product of u 1 and u 2 which is simply the sum of the product of the components it is 1 into 1 which is 1 plus 1 into minus 1 which is minus 1 plus 1 into 1 plus we have uh, the 1 into minus 1 which gives me 0. And therefore, we have that u 1 is orthogonal to u 2. Similarly, u 1 is orthogonal to u 3 and u 2 is orthogonal to u 3. So, this u 1, u 2, u 3 are orthogonal to each other. So, therefore, this set is an orthogonal set. This set is an orthogonal set, but we have the length of u 1 squared which is the u 1 comma u 1 is 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared the sum of the squares of the components which is 4, but we want it to be 1 for normality. So, it is not 1 similarly u 2 comma u 2 is again 1 plus 1 plus 1 sum of the squares of the component that is not 1 u 3 comma u 3 the dot product or inner product of u 3 with itself is 1 squared plus 0 squared plus minus 1 squared plus 0 squared which is 2 which is not 1. So, none of these vectors have length 1, but they are orthogonal to each other. So, this is not hence this is not an orthonormal set this is not an orthonormal set. As before, since we already have orthogonality, we can force now normality by dividing each one of these vectors by its length. So, suppose we now take the set S 1 consisting of these vectors V 1 which is obtained from we have to obtain V 1 from U 1 by dividing you have to take this vector u 1 and divide it by its length. So, we get 1 by 2 into 1 1 1 1. Similarly, we divide u 2 by its length and we get u 3 by its length and then we get these vectors. Now, this is an orthonormal set. in R 4. 
So, thus by orthonormality we need two requirements for a set of vectors to be orthonormal the name suggests it ortho and normal. The word ortho refers to the fact any two vectors are mutually orthogonal to each other. The word normal refers to the fact that the vectors have been normalized to have length 1. So, we now have this notion of orthonormality in a inner product space particularly R k with this inner product. Now, we are going to look at a very important property of inner of uh, orthonormal sets an important property of I will write O n sets for orthonormal sets. So, we will now look at a very important property of orthonormal sets. So, suppose we have S u 1, u 2, u r and orthonormal set in R k. Whenever we have a set of vectors in R k, the first thing we investigate is whether this set is linearly independent or not. Whenever you get a set of vectors, we always first look at the fact whether it is linearly independent or linearly dependent. If it is linearly dependent, there is a lot of redundant information we would like to throw it out. So, first we check whether this set is linearly independent, is S linearly independent. For this, we must check whether a linear combination of this u 1, u 2, u r when it is the 0 vector thus forces all the coefficients to be 0. So, we start with a linear combination of these vectors and suppose it is equal to the 0 vector we want to investigate whether that will force all the coefficients to 0. If it forces all the coefficients to be 0 then we are linearly independent, but if we have non-zero coefficients which give 0 vector then we have linear dependent. Now, this implies if we take any vector and take the inner product with this sum take any vector x and inner product with this that is the same as theta k comma x because the sum is equal to theta k, but the inner product of the 0 vector is always 0 with any vector. So, this implies the inner product of the sum with any x is equal to 0 for every x in R k. Now, if I particularly take in particular if we let x equal to u 1 what do we get? We get therefore, alpha 1 u 1 plus alpha 2 u 2 plus alpha r u r u 1 must be equal to 0. Because this inner product is 0 of whatever x I take in particular I have taken x is equal to u 1. Now, the inner product of a sum is the sum of the inner product this property we have seen last time and constants can be pulled out of the inner product. So, this whole thing implies alpha 1 u 1 u 1 plus alpha 2 u 2 u 2 and so on alpha r u r u r is equal to 0 the alpha uh, u 2 u 1 u r u 1 because we are taking the inner product with u 1. Now, alpha 1 u 1 u 1 u 1 is 1 why is u 1 u 1 1 because we are given that u 1 u 2 u r is an orthonormal set when you have an orthonormal set in that set every vector has length 1 u 1 is a member of that orthonormal set and hence it must have length 1 therefore, u 1 u 1 is 1. So, the first term becomes 1 now u 2 u 1 the second term u 2 u 1 is 0 because u 2 and u 1 are members of this orthonormal set and any two vectors in the orthonormal set are orthogonal to each other and therefore, their inner product is 0 and hence u 2 u 1 is 0. Similarly, u 3 u 1 is 0 
u r u 1 is 0 because all these vectors are in that set and any two vectors are orthogonal. So, we simply get alpha 1 equal to 0. Similarly, if we successively take let x equal to u 2 next then u 3 and so on when I let x equal to u 1 I got alpha 1 as 0. If I let x equal to u 2 in this place and take this I get alpha 2 equal to 0 and so on we get alpha 2 equal to alpha 3 equal to alpha r equal to 0. So, thus what we have is alpha 1 u 1 plus alpha r u r equal to theta k implies alpha 1 equal to alpha 2 equal to alpha r equal to 0. This means that the set S of vectors the set of vectors u 1 u 2 r is linearly independent which implies the set of vectors u 1 u 2 u r is linearly independent. So, what we have shown is you start with any linearly uh, any orthonormal set it is automatically forced to be linearly independent conclusion every orthonormal set is linearly independent. So, conclusion every orthonormal set in R k is linearly independent that is a very important property of orthonormal sets. But now let us look at what does this mean an orthonormal set is automatically linearly independent and the moment you have a linearly independent set you wonder whether it is a basis for that to be a basis it must also span the space. So, an orthonormal set will become a basis since it is already linearly independent the only requirement that will be forced further required will be that it spans the space. This leads us to the notion of an orthonormal basis for R k. So, if a set S of vectors in R k is one orthonormal. Remember that when we said we want a basis we want linear independence and we want uh, spanning. Now, linear independence it can be now replaced by orthonormal because orthonormal automatically implies linearly independent. So, we want orthonormal and it spans L s is R k the span of the set s is R k such a basis is called a uh, vector in R 4 such that it is orthonormal is called an orthonormal basis we will put it this way. So, a set is an orthonormal basis if it is orthonormal and it is a spanning set. So, these are the two things required for a set to be an orthonormal basis. Remark similarly if W is a subspace of R k then a subset S of W is called an orthonormal basis for W if 1 we want orthonormal. So, S is S must be orthonormal. So, we have S is orthonormal and we want it to span that means L s it must span what now it must we are looking for a basis for W and therefore, it must span 
w. So, an orthonormal set in w which also spans w is called an orthonormal basis for w. So, let us look at one or two simple examples. Let us take R 3 clearly E 1 equal to 1 0 0 E 2 equal to 0 1 0 E 3 equal to 0 0 1 is an orthonormal basis for R 3. What is it? we know clearly that these are orthogonal to each other because the dot product of any one of them is 0 with the other and then each one of them has length 1 and any vector x 1, x 2, x 3 and r 3 is obviously x 1 times e 1 plus x 2 times e 2 plus x 3 times e 3. So, this spans r 3. So, this is linear, this is orthonormal and spans and therefore, it is a basis. So, this is the simplest example. Similarly, for r k e 1 equal to 1 0 0 0 with k components e 2 has second component 1 all other 0 and you go on like that e k has the last component 1 the kth component all other 0 is an orthonormal basis. These are very simple examples. Let us look at another example. Let us take R 3, let us take the vectors u 1 equal to 1 1 0, u 2 is equal to 1 minus 1 0, u 3 is equal to 0 0 1. This is a basis, <coughs> it is easy to verify that this is linearly independent, this is there are three vectors for R 3 for something to form a basis any three linearly independent vectors in R 3 will form a basis for R 3. There are three linearly independent vectors. So, there are three of them and dimension of R 3 is 3. Therefore, these form a basis first thing we notice is that these form a basis for R 3. Now, every vector here is orthogonal to each other because the dot product of u 1 and u 2 is 1 into 1 plus minus 1 into 1 plus 0 into 0 which is 1 minus 1 which is 0. Similarly, u 2 and u 3 are orthogonal and u 3 and u 1 are orthogonal. So, these vectors are orthogonal. So, it they form an orthogonal basis for R 3. They form an orthogonal basis for R 3. However, they do not form an orthonormal basis. because the normality condition is not satisfied. These vectors do not have length because these vectors do not have length 1. Now, therefore, since we already have orthogonality in order to get normality all we have to do is divide each one of these vectors by length 1. When we say that they do not have length 1, u 3 has length 1, but u 1 and u 2 do not have length 1. Even if one vector fails to have length 1, we lose the normality condition. So, therefore, if we now define v 1 to be 1 by root 2 1 1 0, this is obtained by dividing u 1 this vector u 1 by its length what is its length? Length is 1 uh, root 2 and therefore, we divide by the length root 2. Similarly, we divide v 2 by its length 
and V3 does not require any division because it already has length 1. This is an orthonormal basis for R3. So, therefore, even though this these original vectors u1, u2, u3 did not form a basis, we have got a new basis by dividing them by the length because these vectors were already orthogonal, we needed to do only normality. Let us now look at R3. In R3, consider the subspace. W which consists of all those vectors which are of this form alpha beta alpha plus beta alpha beta real numbers. What it means is all those vectors for which the third component is the sum of the first two components all the third component is alpha plus beta which is the sum of the first two components alpha and beta ok. Clearly, u 1 equal to 1 1 1 0 1 u 2 equal to 0 1 1 is a basis for w because these two vectors belong to w and they are linearly independent and every vector in w is a linear combination of these vectors. So, all the conditions required for basis is satisfied. However, this is not an orthogonal basis because the two vectors are not orthogonal to each other because u1 u2 the inner product is 1 into 0 is 0 plus 0 into 1 the product of the second component is 0 into 1 is 0 but the product of the third component is 1 into 1 so the u1 u2 is 1 not equal to 0 and therefore, the vectors are not orthogonal and therefore, it does not form an orthogonal basis and therefore, not even orthonormal basis. It is not even normal. So, it does not have uh, either orthogonality property or the normality property. However, if we take V 1 equal to 1 by root 2 1 0 1 and v 2 is equal to 1 by root 6 minus 1 2 1. We see that v 1 belongs to w because v 1 is simply the multiple of the vector u 1 a 1 by root 2 multiple of the vector u 1 we have here. So, v 1 is just the 1 by root 2 multiple of u 1 and since u 1 is in w any multiple will be in w. v 2 is a vector in w why first of all if you look at minus 1 2 1 the third component is the sum of the first and the second and therefore, this part belongs to w and any multiple of that will belong to w and therefore, v 1 v 2 belong to w that is the first thing that we observe. Secondly, v 1 or v 2 are orthogonal to each other because 1 minus 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 0. So, the dot product is 0. Thirdly, we observe that the length of v 1 is 1 and the length of v 2 is 1 and therefore, v 1 v 2 is an orthonormal set in w and therefore, linearly independent set in w. Since u 1 u 2 is a basis for w the dimension of we have seen that the u 1 u 2 is a basis for w. So, dimension of w is 2 any two linearly independent vectors in w will form a basis which says since dimension w equal to 2 this implies that v 1 v 2 is an orthonormal basis for w. 
So, we have a subspace here for which we have an orthonormal we have found an orthonormal basis. Now, we shall look at what is the effect of this orthonormal basis. We have seen that whenever you have a basis every vector in that space can be expanded as a linear combination of the vectors in that basis and therefore, in particular if we have an orthonormal basis then every vector in that space can be expanded as a linear combination of this orthonormal basis. Let us look at this expansion. So, we will call this the expansion in terms of orthonormal basis. So, first let us look at R k, let us consider R k and let us say B, let us call it phi 1, phi 2, phi k, any basis must contain exactly k vectors. So, an orthonormal basis for k for R k. So, suppose we have a orthonormal basis for R k, then any vector x in R k, we can expand it as x is equal to x 1 phi 1 plus x 2 phi 2 plus x k phi k. What we do not know what this x 1, x 2, x k are. So, let us call them as uh, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha k to at the moment we do not know what they are. So, given a vector x in R k all we can say is there exist numbers alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha k all of them are real such that x can be written as a linear combination of the phi 1, phi 2, phi k with these alphas as the coefficients. Now, suppose I now take the inner product with phi 1, the dot product with phi 1 that is the same as alpha 1 phi 1 plus alpha 2 phi 2 plus alpha k phi k comma phi 1 because x is that sum. Again as before if we take the dot product phi 1 phi 1 will give 1, phi 2 phi 1 will give 0, phi 3 phi 1 will give 0, phi k phi 1 will give 0 because phi 1 phi 2 phi k is an orthonormal set. So, that says x phi 1 is equal to alpha 1. So, this says the coefficient of phi 1 in the expansion of x is precisely the dot product or the inner product of x with phi 1. Similarly, the coefficient of phi 2 will be the dot product of x with phi 2 and so on and so forth. And similarly, x phi j will be equal to alpha j for j equal to 1, 2 up to k and hence every x in R k can be expanded in terms of the orthonormal basis as x is equal to x comma phi 1 phi 1 plus x comma phi 2 phi 2 plus so on x comma phi k phi k. So, we know precisely how to find the coefficients. Notice that it is much easier to find the coefficients in the expansion with respect to the orthonormal basis because to find the coefficient with respect to phi 1, we need to know only the relationship between x and phi 1 namely the dot product of x and phi 1. To find the coefficient corresponding to phi 2, we need to know only the relationship between x and phi 2 namely the dot product and phi x with phi 2 and so on. So, therefore, in these cases it is much easier to find this orthonormal uh, expansion in terms of orthonormal basis. In general 
situation when we deal with vector spaces, abstract and abstract inner products which generalize the dot product. Such expansions are referred to as the Fourier expansion, the generalized Fourier expansion of x with respect to the orthonormal basis B. This general and the x phi j is the coefficient, the coordinate or the component of x with respect to this uh, ordered basis B is called the jth Fourier coefficient of x with respect to this ordered basis B. We have an order here phi 1, phi 2, phi k. So, we us treat this as an ordered orthonormal basis. So, therefore, the first conclusion is that every vector can be expanded in this form. So, this is the first important conclusion. Once we have an orthonormal basis, every vector can be expanded in a Fourier expansion with respect to this orthonormal basis. Something interesting happens. Okay. Suppose we had x and we had uh, the first the standard basis we will call this the standard basis 1 0 0 0 e 2 as 0 1 0 0 and so on and finally, e k as 0 0 0 1 this is the standard basis and if I have x which is x 1 x 2 x k then if I expand with respect to this standard or the Fourier expansion of x with respect to this basis is nothing but x is equal to x 1 e 1 plus x 2 e 2 plus x k e 2. Because x comma e 1 the dot product of x and e 1 picks up only the first coordinate the dot product of x and e 2 picks up the second coefficient and so on and so forth. And therefore, we have the Fourier expansion of x with respect to s as this. And similarly, if I take a vector y which is y 1 y 2 y k then the Fourier expansion of y with respect to this will be y 1 e 1 plus y 2 e 2 plus y k e k. Where x j is actually equal to x e j and y j is equal to y e j. Now, what is the dot product of x and y or the inner product of x and y? It is x 1 y 1 plus x 2 y 2 plus x k y 2, which is the sum of the products of the Fourier coefficients with respect to this basis here. Yes. Remember, this x 1 x 2 x k and y 1 y 2 y k these are all the Fourier coefficients. So, this is the product of the first two Fourier coefficients of x and y this is the product of the Fourier coefficient of x second Fourier coefficients this is the product of the kth Fourier coefficient. So, the <coughs> inner product or the dot product is the sum of the products of the first k Fourier the k Fourier coefficients. Now, let us look at the Fourier expansion in terms of our ordered uh, orthonormal basis a general orthonormal basis phi 1 phi 2 phi k. Then we have x is equal to x phi 1 phi 1 plus x phi 2 phi 2 and so on x phi k phi k. This is what the Fourier expansion we obtained that the Fourier expansion of any vector the coefficients are simply the dot product of x with those vectors. Similarly, y is y phi 1 phi 1 plus y phi 2 phi 2 and so on y phi k phi k. Now, if I take the dot product of x and y I will have to take the dot product of this sum with respect to this sum. Now, when we take the dot products the cross terms go away 
because phi i comma phi j will be 0 if i is not equal to j and the, di the direct terms phi 1 comma phi 1 will give you 1. So, this will simply be x phi 1 y phi 1 plus x phi 2 y phi 2 and so on x phi k y phi k which simply says again we get the inner product of x and y as the product of the corresponding Fourier coefficients. So, whether you choose the standard ordered basis namely u 1 u 2 u k or whether you choose any arbitrary orthonormal basis the inner product is always the sum of the product of the corresponding Fourier coefficient. So, therefore, the next important property is thus x comma y is equal to summation j equal to 1 to k x phi j y phi j for every x y in r k. This is referred to as the Plancherel's formula. Once again, if we put y equal to x in the above, we get x equal to x, which is the length of x squared, is sum of j equal to 1 to k x phi j the whole square. Now, again, this boils down to saying whatever ordered basis whatever ordered orthonormal basis you choose the length squared is always the sum of the corresponding Fourier coefficient squared. In the standard ordered basis if we take this vector x 1 x 2 x k the length is simply x 1 square plus x 2 square plus x k square. But if we take an arbitrary uh, ordered orthonormal basis then the length of x squared is the sum of the squares of the corresponding Fourier coefficients. This for this is true for every x in R k and this is called the Parseval's identity. This is called the Parseval's identity. So, now we have given an orthonormal basis we can expand every vector in terms of this orthonormal basis. The coefficients are called the Fourier coefficients and whenever you want to take the inner product of two vectors you have to simply take the sum of the products of the corresponding Fourier coefficients. Whenever you want to find the length squared you have to only find the sum of the squares of the Fourier coefficients of that vector with respect to this orthonormal. Whatever orthonormal basis we choose this is this identities hold. These are very important facts. Note that if a vector x is theta k then all its Fourier coefficients must be 0 because x phi j is equal to 0 ok. First of all it is equal to theta k phi j, but the inner product of the 0 vector with anything is 0. So, all the Fourier coefficients are 0 and therefore, we get norm x squared is 0 which is what we want because the length vector is 0. So, we have whenever x is the 0 vector that says the Fourier coefficients are all 0 for every j equal to 1 to k. Conversely, if x phi j is 0 for all j then the Fourier expansion tells you all the coefficients are 0 and therefore, the vector must be 0. So, a vector is the 0 vector if and only if it is orthogonal to all the basis vectors. This is one criterion for phi 1 phi 2 phi j to be a basis ok. We will look at it later. Remark we can do the same thing in a subspace also. So, let w be a subspace of R k dimension of w is d b w is w 1 
let me call it again the same phi notation for an orthonormal basis phi 1 phi 2 phi d orthonormal basis for w then we can restrict our Fourier expansion within w x is equal to summation j equal to 1 to d x phi j phi j for every x in w. So, every vector x in w can be expanded in the Fourier expansion x comma y is equal to summation j equal to 1 to d x phi j y phi j for every x y in w and finally, this norm condition norm x squared is equal to summation j equal to 1 to d x phi j squared for every x in w. So, if we take w equal to r k we get all the results we had before, but we can also restrict ourselves to a subspace and we get the corresponding results. Now, we raise a question. We have R k, we have a linearly independent set. We saw that either S is basis, this will happen if S has k vectors, say if S has k vectors, because if you have k vectors and any k linearly independent vectors will form a basis. So, if S has k vectors is already a basis or can extend S to a basis for R k. This is a basis, it is already a basis for R k or it can be extended to a basis for R k. Now, if we start with S an orthonormal set, we have seen that S is linearly independent and therefore, any linearly independent set is either S is basis and this will happen if S has a k vectors is observed. Now, if it is a basis it is already orthonormal and therefore, orthonormal basis, but now because it is a R if it does not have k vectors we can extend it. to a basis, but we do not know whether what we have extended to is an orthonormal basis. So, question is can we extend to an orthonormal basis. So, given any orthonormal set it is either a basis an orthonormal basis or it is a linearly independent set which can be extended to a basis. The question is can we extend it to an orthonormal basis. In other words is every orthonormal set a basis or can be converted to an orthonormal basis. Now, we shall investigate this question the main ingredient that is required for this is what is known as the Gram Schmidt orthonormalization. The main idea of the Gram Schmidt orthonormalization is that given any linearly independent set, we convert it to an orthonormal set in such a way the space that we span are not lost. We shall look at the details of this conversion in the next lecture.